Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. I'm going to review a mini PC today. This is the Minis Forum HX77G. And this model is very similar to two others I've reviewed here on this channel. And the thing that sets these models apart is they have their own dedicated graphics card inside. The model that we're reviewing today is going to be a more budget-minded device. So the CPU is a Ryzen 7 7735HS, but it does have the same graphics card as we've tested previously. That's the AMD Radeon RX 6600M. And this is a laptop GPU, but basically put inside of a larger mini PC. And there's a couple advantages and disadvantages to this kind of setup. A big advantage here is going to be the space savings compared to something like a larger desktop PC. And so when you put it on its stand, you can actually see that it's not that much larger than a laptop that's stored vertically. But of course, there are going to be some drawbacks from a setup like this as well, and we'll get into that in this video. For now, let's just go ahead and jump right into the unboxing and see what we're working with. Inside the box, it's pretty standard fare. They have a warning not to remove the CPU cooler because they're using liquid metal as their thermal conductor. Additionally, there is an instruction manual that'll basically go over each of the components. It also comes bundled with a 262 watt charging plug. And it's a little on the big side, but it does have quite a bit of wattage. Also inside, you'll have a stand in case you want to store it vertically. And then other than that, we just have an HDMI port. So let's go ahead and do a deeper dive into the mini PC itself, starting with the price and specs. Now, one of the things I like about minis form PCs is they do come in a bare bones configuration. That means it won't come with any RAM or storage in case you want to add that yourself. And as you can see, the bare bones price is 640 bucks. Now the minimum configuration is 32 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage, and that'll bring the price up to $780 if you want to have it already installed. So in terms of mini PCs, this is definitely on the high end of the spectrum. However, it is the cheapest you can find in the mini PC space with a dedicated graphics card. Now let's do a real quick deep dive into the specs. Of note, the Ryzen 7 CPU we have inside has 8 cores and 16 threads, and a base clock of 3.2 GHz, but can be turbo clocked up to 4.75. And it does have the 8GB version of the RX 6600M GPU. It's a little bit older of a GPU, it's about 2 years old at this point, but it still seems to work pretty well as you'll see later on. Of note, we have dual channel DDR5 RAM, but in checking the specs, the RAM that I was sent has 2400MHz speed. I'm not sure if that's going to be the same on the retail models, but I did want to bring that up because I didn't find it in any of their spec sheets. A couple other things I want to point out, we have 4 different video outputs. We have 2 HDMI that are capable of 4K at 60Hz, and we we also have two USB 4 ports that are video out capable as well. And these are capable of an 8K resolution with a 60 Hz refresh rate. Okay, moving forward, let's talk a little bit about the ports themselves. We'll start with the front. Here we have a USB-A port on the far left, and then we have headphone microphone jacks and a USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-C port. On the back we have our power plug, and then two HDMI ports, and then those two USB 4 ports underneath. And to the right of that we have three USB-A ports, these are all 3.2, but one is Gen 2 and the other two are Gen 1. And then finally on the right we have a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port. Now in terms of sizing, you can see that this is quite a big mini PC compared to some of the other smaller models we have in the market. This is the B-Link SCR7, and I reviewed this a couple weeks back. This is definitely a more small form factor PC, and as you can see it is quite a bit smaller than the one we're reviewing today. Now as I showed previously, you can set this up vertically, but I also wanted to note that you can just leave it on its side as well. In fact, this has two different cooling fans and they are both on the top, and on the bottom there's actually no ventilation happening at all. Everything is really happening from the sides and the top of the machine. So no matter which way you orient it, you will probably get some really great cooling. Speaking of which, you might be wondering about the fan noise, let's go ahead and give you a listen right here at full speed. So you may not actually hear anything, because it is a very quiet mini PC, it has a pleasant kind of hum to it. And here's that shot again of me showing it vertically oriented. This is actually my HX99G, so the top of line version of that same line. And I've been using this as my studio PC for about 6 months at this point, I really like it. And you can also see that the footprint here is not that much larger than my MacBook when set up vertically as well. So if you are looking for something that's vertically oriented and not taking up a bunch of space, then something like this might work really well. Now let's go ahead and do a quick teardown just to see what we're working with inside. One of the annoying things about this model is that these screws are hidden behind rubber feet, and in order to access them you have to actually take the rubber feet off, which means you're going to lose some of that stickiness every time you do it. Either way, it's just four Phillips head screws to get it off, and you'll also want to use a guitar pick around the sides to undo the clips. After that we have a large metal frame that you can take right off, it just uses a Phillips head screwdriver again. And now we have a look at the actual components inside. 
First thing you may notice is we have an additional M.2 slot right here, so if you want to expand the storage, it's going to be very easy without having to mess with the original one. And here are the RAM sticks, and they have heat sinks actually glued to them to keep them nice and cool. So I'm not really able to show you what brand they are, but this is what they look like. It's a similar story with the SSD, but thankfully this one is easy to disassemble. And you can see with my review unit, they are using a Kingston brand SSD. Now when we turn the device on, we can see in the system properties that yes, it has the Ryzen 7 7735HS, and it is installed with 32GB of RAM, and it's running Windows 11 Pro. Next, we'll do a couple tests starting with the idle wattage as well as temperature. You can see here that when nothing else is running, we're getting about 5 watts of power draw from the CPU, and the CPU temperature seems to hover around 44-45 degrees Celsius. Now if we start a CPU intensive benchmark like Cinebench, you will see that all the CPU cores are going to max out at 100%. You'll also see that the power profile will jump up to 54 watts, which is the max TDP configured by AMD. You'll also see that the temperature is going to rise pretty quickly, up to about 75 degrees Celsius in that first minute. Now one thing I did notice is after about 7 or 8 minutes it capped out to about 80 degrees Celsius in the CPU, and it appears that at that threshold some sort of thermal throttling is happening because the CPU power drops down to about 45 watts. Now the CPU clock speed is still going over the base clock, which is 3.2 GHz, but I did want to make note that when using CPU intensive tasks like this benchmark, I am seeing it drop below 54 watts over time. And when looking at just the CPU performance on its own, it's not the best. You can see that the Cinebench score is about 13,000 points, which I would say is about middle tier when it comes to CPU performance. So in terms of using this as a workstation, I'm not really sure it's going to be a perfect fit for that one use case. And honestly, I think that makes sense because with that dedicated the graphics card, this is definitely more oriented towards gaming. So I did a couple gaming related benchmarks with Horizon Zero Dawn. To start, you can see here that I ran it at 1080p on ultimate settings, and as you can see here, this is getting a stable 60 frames per second, no problem whatsoever. In fact, if we bump up the resolution to 1440p, again with ultimate quality settings, we're getting that same average frame rate. So this is a quick and early indicator to me that this will probably be best suited for 1440p gaming, but of course we should always try to max out when we can, and so here is 4K ultimate quality, and you can see here that the average frame rate is actually 32 frames per second. So if you prefer a more cinematic experience and you don't necessarily require 60 frames per second, 30 frames per second seems doable here at least with this game. Now one thing to make note of is that benchmarks will not necessarily indicate exactly how a game will perform. So for example here with that same game, 1440p ultra settings, I was not getting an average of 59 or 60 frames per second. Instead the average is about 55 frames per second. I still think that's really good, but if you want to have a more stable 60 frames per second you might have to dip down in the quality settings. Here we are at 1440p in high settings and yeah, this is working just fine. So let's go ahead and start with some PC game testing, really focusing on those high-end games. To start, here's Doom Eternal running at 1440p in ultra settings, and I've turned the V-Sync off to try to get as high of a frame rate as possible. And here you can see we're getting an average of about 115 frames per second, so it's doing great. Here's another example of God of War, again with V-Sync off, but with high settings and 1440p resolution. This one is also staying well above 60 frames per second, so that's where I would cap it personally. Same thing with Marvel's Spider-Man, this one can get well over 60 frames per second at 1440p high settings, so again, I think this is a great 60 frames per second solution. Same thing with Elden Ring, this one runs at 60 frames per second in high settings 1440p. And after doing a bunch of testing, I think that 1440p was really just my standard PC gaming resolution. Whether or not I could play it in high settings or medium settings really depended on the game, but for many of these I was pleasantly surprised that at this resolution I could reliably depend on 60 frames per second for most games. Even the games that I would consider to be more of a benchmark game than something I actually play, you know, like Witcher 3 or Red Dead Redemption 2, these also did a really good job staying stable at around 60 frames per second at this resolution. Now I don't want to paint the picture that every single game is going to play that way because I did find some dips here and there. For example, with Hellblade, I found that this one would usually get an average of pretty close to 60 frames per second, but as I spun the camera around, I also found it dipping here and there. Now this is very early in the game, so maybe it's something that will stabilize the more you play it, but I did want to note that it wasn't completely seamless with every single game. It's a similar story with Cyberpunk 2077. This one I played at high settings 1440p, and I also had the auto FSR feature turned on. 
But as you can see here, it kind of wiggles between 55 and 60 frames per second. Still definitely playable for me with these settings, but if you are a stickler for having something super smooth, this didn't quite reach that. And of course, there are some games that really just eat up a lot of resources. Control is an excellent example. At 1440p, I got an average of about 45 frames per second on high settings. So in this one, I actually dropped it down to 1080p high settings, and even then it wasn't 60 frames per second, but it was pretty close. I would say the average here is about 55 frames per second. Again, totally playable. It's really going to come down to what you prefer. Do you want to have a higher frame rate or a higher graphical resolution? For example, with Destiny 2, I prefer to have it at least at 60 frames per second, and I don't mind dipping it down to 1080p. So in this example, I'm getting about 130 frames per second on average with these settings. And of course, even though I'm focusing on more recent games, if you play something older, you can probably play it in 4K. For example, here's Grand Theft Auto V with high settings, 4K resolution, and we are getting a very stable 60 frames per second. So in some cases, it'll really depend on what you specifically want to play. Now let's move on to emulation, and we're going to focus again on some of that high-end stuff. We'll go right into PS2. You can see here that at a 6x resolution, which is well beyond 4K, it is playing at full speed. So yes, when it comes to GameCube and PlayStation 2, it should have absolutely no problem playing this at a full 4K resolution. Now the original Xbox is from the same generation, but it's a lot harder to emulate. For this one, I chose to run everything at a 3X resolution instead of a full 4K. So the resolution here is closer to 1440p, but as you can see, it's still running really well. So in terms of original Xbox emulation, I think you will be set with this machine. Just bear in mind that not every game is going to play well due to compatibility. Now let's move forward to Nintendo Wii U. This one actually went into the individual graphics packs and upscaled everything to a 1440p resolution. And even then with that upscale, most games actually played at full speed, 60 frames per second with Mario Kart 8 and 30 frames per second with Legend of Zelda Wind Waker HD. Now this one originally played at 30 frames per second, so that's why we're seeing this frame rate here, but as you can see, it's playing really well. For Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, I got very close to 60 frames per second with that 1440p upscale, but I did get some dips down to around 55 here and there. The way I see it, if I didn't have these stats showing up on the top left, I wouldn't even have noticed that dip at all. So I do think that this is going to play Wii U content upscaled to 1440p absolutely no problem. Next, we're going to move over to Nintendo Switch emulation. We'll start with Super Mario Odyssey, one of the harder games to emulate. And here you can see I'm running it at a 2x upscale in in-docked mode. So essentially, this is running at about a 1440p or 4K, depending on the game. And as you can see, this is also running at 60 frames per second, no hiccups whatsoever. It's a similar story with Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. I would get a hiccup as shaders were compiling, but after that, it was running really smoothly. And finally, we have this game right here. I'm running this at a 1440p upscale using a graphic mod. And as you can see here, we're getting an average frame rate of about 35 frames per second. This is actually pretty great. Now, if you wanted to have a higher frame rate, you could do 1080p, and I think that would still look really good. But all the same, I would consider anything over 30 frames per second to be very playable, and in this case, I would consider this one to be a lot of fun. Okay, moving over to Xbox 360, this one I played at a native resolution just because messing with the graphical settings can really mess up those games. The development on this emulator is still kind of in its infancy, and so because of that, I don't really like messing with the settings. Either way, at a native resolution, you can see that every game I threw at it actually played at full speed. So it's really going to come down to compatibility and whether or not the game will even play on the emulator, but if it will, then I think it'll run on this machine, no problem. And then finally, in terms of emulation, I also wanted to try PlayStation 3. For a couple games, I did try a 2x upscale. The issue here is that the PlayStation 3 emulator will get a lot of graphical glitches if you try to upscale it with certain games. So if you're going to be running this emulator on a machine like this, it might be worth it to try a 2x upscale, but if it gets a little bit wonky, you might have to just drop it down to native resolution. Regardless, I found that for most games at a native resolution, they played just fine. Although some of the more heavyweight games didn't play at a 100% full speed. For example, with Infamous, this one averaged about 40 frames per second altogether in the open world. So definitely not a full 60 frames per second, but something I would consider to be still playable. It's a similar story with Metal Gear Solid Ground Zeroes. This is always a great test game because it's very hard to play, but we are getting over 30 frames per second. The big issue here is that we're seeing a lot of graphical glitches, which is pretty typical with this game. But but at the very least, from a performance standpoint, I think this would definitely be something worth trying as well. Okay, in addition to just straight emulation, there were a couple other things I wanted to show off that you could do with this machine. We're going to start here with Botacera. So this is a Linux-based custom firmware, and this is loaded up on an external SSD that I have plugged into the USB 4 port on the back. And this will be a great solution if you wanted to use a mini PC like this in a more living room kind of setup. 
with the setup that I'm running right here, everything is on the SD card. The emulators and the ROMs themselves are all going to be running from that. And Bodicera works great with this machine. It is taking full advantage of that GPU. And so as a result, when it comes to playing emulated systems, this is going to play all the high-end stuff as well. So this is going to work really well if you want a gaming-focused setup that's independent of your Windows installation. Another nice thing about a Bodicera setup like this is that you can also access your Steam library from within the operating system. And I've made a whole video talking about how you can do this on basically any PC and walking you through that entire process. But this will be a nice setup too if you want to have something that's more retro gaming focused but then also want to dip into a couple PC games here and there. And in addition to using a Linux based firmware like this you could also just set up something like a front end in Windows. But all the same I did want to test that Bodicera is working and yeah it's working great. Now given the fact that we have so much power under the hood with this mini PC we can also set up other features for example this one here called multi-seating. And there's a new app that just came out a couple weeks ago called Duo that will automate this process for you. And the setup here is very similar to streaming, but with a couple neat features. So I'm going to leave this link down below in case you want to read a little bit more on it. But essentially all you have to do is go to their GitHub page and we have both a free and a full version. And the full version is different from the free version in the fact that you can manually adjust your refresh rate and you can have multiple sessions running at once. For our use case, we're just going to use the standard free version. So I'm just going to download that and install it on my machine. From there, I'm going to set up my host configuration and then start it running. From there, it'll use an app called Moonlight to set up a streaming service. And then you can use any other device to connect to that via the Moonlight app. So in this example, I'm using the iNeo Pocket Air. This is an Android based device and I just installed the Moonlight app from the Play Store. And when I connected it to my PC, you can see I have two different desktops running at once. So what is happening here is that my mini PC is actually splitting off two different functions between these PCs. And because they're working independently from one another, we can do twice as much work. So this will be great if you have one PC in the house, but multiple people who want to play games. For example, my iNeo Pocket Air can run Moonlight and then play Steam games that are already installed on that PC. And at the same time, you can still use your regular PC. So if you want to do some spreadsheets or some web browsing, you can do all that at the same time. In addition, if you have two different Steam accounts, you could actually play multiplayer against one another with the same computer. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of possibility with a mini PC like this. Because we have a dedicated graphics card, that means that we can share some of those resources between multiple workstations. Anyway, if you think this setup might work pretty well for you, I'll leave a link down below. All right, and so in wrapping things up here, let's talk about what I like and what I don't like about the HX77G. Now, in terms of what I like, I think the most obvious answer is going to be the performance. It can reliably play most PC games at a 1440p resolution, which I think is pretty impressive for such a small PC. In addition, this can emulate anything you can throw at it, even if you want to try to upscale some of those high-end systems. I also do appreciate the fact that it has a smaller size. I'm very familiar with this form factor just because I've been using them for several months. And I love the fact that you can set them up vertically because it saves a lot of desk space. I've also found that the fan speed on this is quiet. It's not silent, but even when it does make some noise, it's a very pleasant hum. Now, of course, there are always things I can nitpick, so let's talk about what I don't like about this machine. Number one, I think this is at the very edge of what I would consider to be a mini PC. Especially if you're going to lay it horizontally like you see in this picture, it does take up quite a bit of space. Another thing about this machine is I would not classify it as being a multi-purpose workhorse. If anything, I would say it's very much so oriented towards gaming. For example, I don't think it'll be optimal for CPU intensive programs. Things like AutoCAD or maybe some video editing may not be the best fit for this. So I think if you are looking specifically for gaming, yeah, this is going to be a good fit. But for everything else, you may want to get something with a little bit more CPU power. And of course, the price point can definitely be an issue. For example, if you don't get the bare bones version, it's going to be $780, which is quite expensive. Additionally, once you start getting to around that $800 price point, I think you should also maybe consider a laptop. Now, because this GPU is a little bit old, I had a hard time finding any laptop that actually used the 6600M. But I did find this one Lenovo ThinkPad, which you see comes in at about 940 bucks. Bear in mind, this does have less RAM and storage, but it also comes with its own screen, trackpad, and keyboard. Not to mention the fact that it's a laptop with its own battery, which means it's a lot more portable than the HX77G. Either way, my main point here is that once you're getting to that $800 plus price point, you should look at your other form factor options as well. And then finally, this one also has to do with form factor in that we have some limited upgrade options with the hx 77 7G. Yes, we could upgrade the RAM and install a second SSD, but the thing about tower PCs is that you can upgrade certain components as you wish. So in comparison with a full desktop PC, that one can actually be used to upgrade the CPU and GPU over time. 
So when it comes down to it, the HX77G does have a lot of good performance, but you really need to know what you're getting yourself into if you pick one of these up. When it comes down to it, if you want to play PC games at about a 1440p resolution as of right now, yeah, it's going to play just about everything. And it's definitely a powerhouse when it comes to emulation as well. In the end, my recommendation comes down to two things. Number one, do you want to have dedicated graphics? And number two, do you want something with a smaller form factor? If both of those two components are very important to you, then yes, I think the HX 77G is a really great mini PC. However, if size is not an issue for you, then I would say that a tower PC is probably going to do you a lot better for your money. Or if you're okay with playing games at a 1080p resolution instead of 1440p, there's some really great integrated graphics card mini PC options out there as well. And if you haven't seen it before, I have a full spreadsheet of all the mini PCs I've ever reviewed on this channel. I think there's like 34 or 35 at this point. So this is really easy to be able to just kind of navigate through your price point and find whatever mini PC I reviewed and see if it's a good fit. Anyway, that's about it for this video here. Let me know what you think of the HX77G in the comments below. As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful. And we'll see you next time. Happy gaming.